Come on, Scope Temple. Let's do a brief discussion tonight so that I won't leave you. Let's go ahead and do this. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Good evening. 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 How are you, everyone? I can barely see these, of course, but so good. Hey, 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 I saw Diamond. Telefero, thank you so much, sir. I was coming for you in a minute. If I hadn't seen you in the in the in the place. Um Glory to the Lord. Let me go where I can. Focus for a minute. Pastor DeAndre, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Apostle Mike, I love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Vince Henderson, thank you, sir. Robert Rush, I love you. I really do. Hey, if you ever get the uh, the courage, Rob Rush, I think me and you need to do a sun scope. Tell everybody our story. I don't think you're ready. <laughs> I don't think you're ready. <laughs> it will bless a lot of people, though. Prophetess Keisha, I love you so much, dearly. Okay. Ricky Watson, how are you? Uh-oh. I'm stepping over Mickey Mouse trucks in Karen Elm. Okay. Courage, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at Rob Rush. <laughs> oh, hi, Vicky. I think I just saw you uh, somewhere. Hello from Maryland. Yeah, Rob. Rob Rush. Listen, we got a. I've got some dramatic stories. I think yours may be. That's not top three. It's probably top fifteen. <laughs> so I don't think you're ready. All right, y'all. Let's do this. Bishop Jordan. God bless you. Amen. See you in India. I will be there tomorrow night. If you are in India, no, you're not down. You're not. I'm telling you, you're not ready. You're not ready. If you are anywhere in Indianapolis, I'll be there tomorrow. Clack, I don't think you want to hear this story. I'll be there tomorrow um, preaching for Pastors Ronald and Nina Guyton of Manifested Power International Ministries. So if you are in the area, um, come and join me. It is going to be good if you are in Indianapolis. Okay. Uh, and then Sunday, of course, I will be back at All Nations. And I will be preaching and starting a new series. Some of my people were telling me they were not looking forward to being at church. Because they don't like the healing uh, series. They feel like when I do healing series that... Uh, I mess with a lot of the devils and soul fear, so it's going to be good. Abba is, I'm going to come for you a bit, but uh, it's time. It's time. So I'm starting a new series, Abba, and uh, I begin it this Sunday, and it's going to be awesome. All right. If you're ready for an interesting discussion, please give me some thumbs and do me a favor. We are at 809. Share this, please. And uh, we're going to have a brief discussion tonight. Got to be up and out to travel tomorrow, so I won't be on here very long. I just want to give you some insight into some of the things I go through in my personal devotion. And I want to let you into some of the discussions that make me the kind of man that God is, that I am and that make me think the, the stuff I do. Uh, come on. This is going to bless you. Give me hearts if you love the Lord. Awesome stuff. We're at 832. Pastor Mary, good to see you. I love you. Uh, Brandon J. Clack, you're amazing. Coffee Conversa, thank you so much. And I think you are an Anwaite from what I remember you telling me, right? I remember that name because I love coffee. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Okay. Come on, keep sharing. Awesome. 879, we're almost there. Good, 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 good. Good. Clax, I'm sending you big old strong WWF hugs. Hey, where's Melvin Cross? I thought you were in here. If you're in here, let me know. I need to give y'all something. All right. I, um, I'm going to give you a little behind the scenes um, insight 
into the types of stuff that me and God go through uh, via chapter. <laughs> me and God go through and me and God talk about. And um, I, I tell you very often about my, my spiritual background and my ministry background and how I came to know the things of the Spirit, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, and, and all of that stuff was by an uh, unusual introduction to God by way of supernatural encounters and hearing things. And it was quite dramatic, very soberly speaking. But the Lord asked me a question that has been a repetitive question. Probably I can say I have heard this from God either in worship, in prayer, um, or during study times, maybe six times in my entire life. So let me give you some backdrop. Um, anybody now, obviously those of you that follow my ministry know the prophetic is my heartbeat. It is what I do. It is what I'm known for. It is, you know, so hearing from God, receiving information from the Lord, having conversations with God, all of that whole jam. Right. But what I'm about to talk to you did not come, uh, to any of that end. It wasn't a conversation with God that was giving me a word for somebody else, a message for somebody else. It was actually, um, now that I was think about it, uh, something that the Lord has asked me pre every major promotion in my life or every season in my life where influence would be broadened. And this started in 1999 when the Lord first asked me this. And then I remember him asking me this at several junctures in my life. And I know something else is on the way to me because he just asked me it again, probably about uh, last week. Um, I was washing my face and you know how you wash your face in the bowl and you get up and look in a mirror and I wipe my face and I heard the voice of the Lord speak to me so clearly and ask me this. So some theological support is whenever God poses a question to anybody, it is never because he's the one that needs to know the answer. And it's never because he's the one that needs to think about the answer. And it's never because he needs to go on a journey for what the answer means to him or his plan. You cannot, as a being who single-handedly knows everything, be enlightened by the response, particularly of something you created. So whether it be, Adam, where art thou? Or Elijah, what are you sitting here? In the Bible, whenever God posed a question to a man, it was rhetorical in the sense that the answer was already known by him. So then, biblically speaking, when God asks questions and when he posed them in moments of silence or sobriety or waiting on him or in his presence... Um, it was always to locate a man, but more importantly, to locate the position of a man's heart and willingness in response to something God would ask them to do next. It was the case with Adam. It was the case with Elijah. It was the case anytime God posed a question, it was always to locate a man and his heart to himself. So that an awareness could be made by that man about where his heart was and, pay attention to this, what could be active in the heart of that man that could possibly interfere with the next assignment. Um, and so this question that I'm about to give you is something that the Lord has asked me probably about six times and I heard it last week. And um, it was kind of God's way of letting me know that he was going to require something of me or some influence was going to change or something. And here's what the Lord asked me. If you're ready, tell me you're ready. Say you're ready. I like to build pointless anticipation. If you want to know what the Lord asked me. All right. Here's what God asked me. And I'm not exaggerating. This is a true story. I'm not using hypotheticals. God has literally asked me this. And um, he asked me this last week and Sunday as I was in worship, I just broke in the presence of the Lord uh, as it relates to my response to what he wanted out of me. And here's what God asked me. The Lord asked me, do you love me enough to be hated for me? 
Do you love me enough to be hated for me? And um, I didn't really, when I first heard it, I obviously wasn't nobody. Nobody knew me. I didn't have responsibility. Um, I had I had a knowing that I was called to preach, um, but I hadn't really taken it to the next level. And when God first started dealing with my heart in the late 90s about preaching, I gave the Lord a tentative yes, provided that people around me, um, leaders, supporters, that they would agree with what my direction was from the Lord. So when God first started dealing with me about preaching all the way in the late 90s, my yes was tentative. I'm like, I didn't know enough to say no. I wasn't fearful. I mean, I had been public speaking and great with words on my life. So I was like, how if, you know, how is this going to happen? Right. So when God first called me to preach and I heard the voice of the Lord out of my grandmother's roof, oddly, speak to me about prophesying before I knew what it was. I said, OK, God, I will do it. And here's what I told God. I will do this if you tell my pastor and you know, at that time I was at a family church. If you tell my pastor and all of my family, if you tell them that this is what you want me to do, I'll do it. And that was the first time in my life heaven told me no. Now, this was pre-everything, uh, pre-degree, pre-all of that. He told me no. And here's what the Lord told me before I, I gave him my first yes. He told me, son... I will not tell them that you're called to do this. I'm not going to reveal to them that this is your purpose because I'm going to ask you to do some things later in life. I remember it like it was yesterday. He said, I'm going to ask you to do some things later in life that people will never agree with and they will never understand. And I want you at this point to learn how to hear me. So God removed, even then, the desire in me or he confronted my desire to have my journey accepted, understood, applauded, praised, verified in any of those things by telling me, no, I'm not going to confirm anything because I want you to learn now how to hear me. Now, this was pre people and crowds and buildings and audiences and all that stuff. So I had no clue everything that the Lord had planned for my life. And I think there's still a lot that I'm not really certain of, but this was the first, the first season. And so he told me then, if you tell me, yes, you've got to love me enough to be hated for me. So I'm like, okay. And what pursued that season and that yes was a series of very gruesome, bloody, painful events that from the outside looking in, everybody would have looked at my processes and said, this is what he get. He left his family church. He's speaking in tongues. He's running all around these churches trying to find acceptance. He don't know what he's doing. Who's going to listen to him? What does he mean to the spirit of God? You know, and this is still in the 90s. He's too young. What is he talking about? And everything around me pointed to um, that being like resistance because of my disobedience to God. But the fact that I told the Lord that I would be hated for him and I was willing to do that because I loved him that much. I knew even then that that resistance was confirmation and that uncomfort was the seal of God and was the embossment. It's like how God branded my life with his wheel. It was his wheel. And then every time I would go to another environment, another man of God, another church, trying to find the fit that I couldn't get, uh, it, it would end more brutally than the last. <laughs> I mean, literally just horror stories. I could give you stuff that's beyond the movie. It's a, it's a documentary, to be very honest. And, and most of it at the hands of church and church leaders. Um, but I remember going into or, or past um, when it was decision making time for college. And I made up my mind. I wanted to be regular and normal. And I wanted the journal that I would be 
a Kappa. I would join the Kappa for uh, uh, fraternity. If I did not go to a HBCU, I would go to um, uh, a Bible college. I would then pursue a degree in law or some sort of thing, and then I would do ministry after that. I would prophesy all of it, uh, <laughs> but I would do that. And so when I went to uh, Or Roberts in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I was, and I'm not lying, I was there probably in 2003. And um, maybe a little earlier than that. And I remember um, being there making decisions, making the arrangements, making the plans for me to stay there. I was like, oh, this is it. I hate Chicago. They don't know nothing about the Holy Ghost. I'm ready to get here. And I was in the maybe center. There was a Caucasian lady playing um, um, an acoustic guitar. We were worshiping during a chapel service. And uh, the Caucasian girl began to sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. And uh, I lifted my hands to begin to worship and I begin to cry again. And I thought to myself, oh, crap, this feels familiar. I was not there alone. Apostle Raleigh Mayberry was with me. A couple of other people were with me. Most of them I don't uh, have a a relationship with today but I wasn't by myself and in worship something changed I had boxes packed scholarships in place uh, majors determined learning people I was even checking out the women on campus to be honest there was a couple of occasions uh, where there was some stuff going on in the dorm rooms I didn't necessarily like, but I was willing to go through all that just to do what I wanted to do. And I remember lifting my hands in worship. That seems to be my common mistake, is that when I made a decision or turned my heart in a direction that's not God, uh, if I worship, I tend to get clarity on what he wants because he poses the questions of his heart and it ruins what I want. Anyway, so I was in worship. And uh, the Lord asked me, do you love me enough to be hated for me? And I'm like, Lord, not right now. I'm loving this song. <laughs> I'm loving this song. This is different worship. I'm not used to this. You know, I'm getting ready for my future. Can you hold on? And the, the, the best way I could describe it was there was a heaviness that leaned into my entire world. I would like to say my face, but I felt like it was a heaviness in my world. And in one moment as I broke, even in that worship, my plans in my hands melted like wax. And in one moment, I was not sure of where I was headed, what I was doing, how I was going to explain that now I would have an alternate route my plans had now changed again. I had to go on the run again from something I knew to be good. And, and my problem at this point was this could not be sinful to come here and live here and be on this campus. This could not be dishonorable. Certainly, you should want to bless this. And the Lord asked me a simple question. I'll never forget it because after he asked it to me, I ran to the prayer tower at RU. There's a massive prayer tower in the middle of the campus that you could go to to pray. And there was a group of Indian people in there praying. Once God asked me that question, I went in there to try to lift what I felt on me. But he asked me, are you willing to be hated? Do you love me enough to be hated for me? Needless to say, I did not stay there. I went home to Chicago and I started the process of what is now known as All Nations Worship Assembly. We started Bible studies. Um... We started getting ready to open up a ministry because God never told me to leave Chicago. I wanted to leave Chicago out of pain. So I remember again, I was pastoring. Now this is a different season in life. A single pastor, unwed, and uh, I mean pretty much just prophesying every Sunday. We are now at this juncture a couple of years later doing Sunday services. I'm doing okay, so I thought, particularly because I didn't have the support and the financial push of a denomination. Nobody was a donor. We started pretty much with a bus card and borrowing my mama's blue Beretta. 
Uh, I did have my own apartment, and um, <clears throat> but we started, crowds started coming, uh, rumors started uh, settling, and um, I was single. And when I was single, uh, I was very, very. I tried to, I tried to date to cure my loneliness. I want you to get this. Everybody around me had options. I had options. People that I was dating and talking to, um, and girls that were all potentials. None of them were cute enough sensitive enough, beautiful enough to heal the issue of loneliness that every call leader must face before they go to their next level of obedience to God. That's another periscope. So I was looking around at all of these guys and they were dating and looking promising. And here I was a good looking, should I say, in my opinion, um, very anointed, um, growing influence, growing an influence preacher with all of these women. I mean, practicing to be Mrs. Stevenson. And the loneliness wouldn't go anywhere. Um, so I made a decision. And in this decision, I had just, I was fed up with being single and I was fed up with dating women that I had to mentor um, to walk beside me for what I knew my future would hold. I just got tired of it. And um, I remember one day, an old classmate, we had this, we, our birthdays were literally the same week. Um, she grew up down the street from my childhood house. We went to school together. She was a beautiful girl. She wasn't saved. But conveniently, when I started pastoring, somehow we found each other again and she was saved. She had just accepted the Lord as her savior. And so I thought the technicality of having to date somebody saved was done and over because now I've met a girl that I'm actually physically attracted to and she's saved. I told God, I took her out, romance and her flowers, roses. And it was clean, nothing dirty. I was pastoring at this point in leadership, so it wasn't a fleshly or a sexual situation. I was in worship. <laughs> I was in worship. And I told God, Lord, I am tired of this loneliness everybody is dating and everybody is together and everybody is romancing and everybody's got pictures of them in it i said to god on 84th and ashland i said god i'm about to get engaged to this girl and i'm not going to seek for your will on it because your hand is on me so if your hand is on me, it's provable. I preach, I prophesy, people are listening to me. If your hand is on me, certainly whatever I do is going to be your will. So if you don't do something, I'm going to marry her and you're going to have to bless it. And the Lord asked me again, I swear to God, do you love me enough? to be hated for me. I instantly knew what it meant. Instantly knew what it meant. The story goes, that girl called me and uh, told me she wanted to go to a Joyce Myers conference. She wanted to go away. So I'm like, this is, she is preparing to be Mrs. Stevenson, the first lady of World Deliverance Center International. Yes, you can go to Joyce Meyer. Go get you some impartation, girl, please. You know. She went to the conference. I even believe I gave her some money to go, you know, and to help out with her expenses. And um, I was too cool, too wise, too smart to tell her that God asked me to be hated for him. And uh, about a week later, week afterwards, she called me. 
she said, hey, we need to talk. I remember we went to, and she didn't want to tell me whatever it was over the phone. So we went to Outback, Outback Steakhouse. And I remember looking at her and I said, okay, so what's up? And she's like, I'm pregnant. I think the look I gave her was more just blank than shocked. I didn't ask how you got pregnant after having gone to a conference because I knew she was there. I didn't ask whether she got pregnant with my money. <laughs> I didn't ask who the dude was. I didn't ask any of that. I just gave him one of the... Because in my self, in my world, I knew maybe about nine days before that, I told the Lord if he didn't do something, I was about to do my thing. And his response was, you love me enough to be hated for me. Um, so that's, <laughs> uh... About a week later, maybe two, I was visiting uh, my father in the Lord's church, sitting on the front row, and uh, I saw the woman that I would later marry. I, I first laid eyes on her maybe about two weeks later after that dinner uh, on the altar where I probably should have been looking to begin with, and she was casting out devils, and she became my wife. So, there's been a couple of times in my life, and me and God, we have this type of relationship where he talks to me about things that are about to come to pass. I mean, he talks to me about people's futures. He gives me details about people's lives. I walk past people and know their stories. I walk up to waiters and know the names of their children Talking to me about secrets and mysteries and having conversations with God is not uncommon. But there was only one thing that grips me when God asks me stuff. And what he asks me before every major shift in my life is do you love me enough to be hated for me? Last week, he asked me again, and I was like, here we go. I know that it means that there's another realm of influence, another door, another scale of visibility, somehow, some way. But I've noticed that behind that question, there was always a shift in my value to the world. There was always a need for me to make an anointed decision and there was always a small space and a small opportunity where my heart had to agree with his and that question preceded every major move of God that has hit my life John 21 15 made me feel a little better because I realize I'm not the only guy that gets confront with questions like this from God. Uh, in John's gospel, Jesus and Peter are getting ready to finish up their earthly interaction. And Jesus has prepared Peter, arguably at this point, to be the most significant apostle. There's 12 of them, sure. One of them have betrayed him at this point. But right now, Peter's the only one that had the level of training necessary to be the successor after Jesus' departure. Of course, he loved John. Certainly, he was related to James. Uh, Doubting Thomas had his shares of issues. But you find out that most of these significant leadership trainings of Jesus happened to Peter. Jesus knew what he was preparing Peter for, whether it be the walking on the water or rebuking him for cutting off the soldier's ear or whether it be uh, 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 any of the rebukes that were normal from Jesus to Peter, you know. 
In John 21, the rules of their relationship changed. My story is at every place of promotion, of influence, of authority, of visibility, God shifts the rules of our relationship by asking me what I'm willing to go without to please him. He did it to, to Peter, John 21, and he asked Peter this question while Peter was in ministry and feeding people and meeting needs and looking at people. Jesus looked at Peter, probably glaring at him in the eyes with a fierceness, a focus, and he asked Peter, lovest thou these more than me? Lovest thou these more than me? It was a game-changing question that would be the open door to ready Peter for him to become the premier voice, the premier leader, the only dude that would be given the keys to the kingdom and the only dude that would have his name changed amongst them. And then the only dude who in the middle of a scattered, persecuted, fearful church in Acts chapter 2 that knew what was going on. Everybody else is shrugging their shoulders and Peter stands up and says, this is that. He knew what was going on. He knew what God was doing. But I don't think it was because he just knew what to do. I think he made a decision in John 21 to love nothing more, to need nothing more, and to want nothing more than him. At the central focus of this leadership lesson tonight is all of you, every one of you are about to experience some level of a shift. Your life is about to undergo a mammoth, massive, gargantuan renovation. People are coming in that you don't know yet. People are leaving that you think you need. But most importantly, as God releases to you the next level of his plan, and as he explains the next dimension of his purpose, he has got to make sure that above all else, you are not a people pleaser. You see, there's no way I could have started to do what I've done or that I could handle what I'm handling or that I could be moving into what I'm moving into if the Lord didn't confront people pleasing very early on in my life. It is the desire to please people that hinders our obedience to him. It is our desire to please people that make us pretend like we are not what we are because we really value being understood by those around us as if having people understand us grants us endurance, peace of mind, security, and or hope. He deals with people pleasing to make sure that on all costs, we're willing to take a risk with him and that we're willing to forfeit our popularity, and our desire to be liked, to do what it is that he has purposed that we do. It would be so easy if our callings and our mandates and our assignments and our purpose and our makeup was easily celebrated and acknowledged and applauded by everybody who named the name of the Lord. And it would be even more easier if what was on our lives and who we are and what we have in us and what we have called by God to do didn't make people mad. Jesus confronts the 12 with this dilemma by saying, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, because if they hated me, they will hate you. He told the 12, you will be hated for my name's sake. There'll be some that love you. 
there'll be some that like you, but there will still be some that make deliberate, methodical, calculated choices to hate you. And it needs be so because what God has put in you demands that you offend, disturb, bother the agendas, the superpowers, the opinions, the mentalities or whatever that fight what is in you. But I sense a shift coming on. I sense an open door. I sense a different degree of favor. I sensed elevated places. I sense raised platforms. I sense a level of responsibility that you can't even cerebrally comprehend. I sense it. But I believe that there is a plumb line, a threshold, a defining moment coming the next time you worship. I feel the anointing. The next time you lift your hands or bow your knee. The next time God has the undivided attention of your heart, I believe one of the things he wants to know is, do you love me enough to be hated for me? <laughs> Are you willing to surrender your need to be understood and your desire to be liked, to have my absolute best for you? <laughs> so that is the question that has changed my life and that has forever changed my life and has always been heaven's early notice that there's a different assignment headed my way. Um, and if you grow with God and if you are a worshiper, you know my plight and it is this. Heaven never decreases a standard over time. You see, the more mature you get, the more aware you become, the more revelation comes to you, the greater your deliverance process, the more aggressive God gets about breaking yokes of fear off of you and layers of generational curses and iniquities that fight your purpose. Yeah. I believe the Holy Ghost is after something different in your life and in your world. And he only raises the standards. Get ready. You are about to have a raised standard in everything about you. Your worship, your timelines, the variables and the factors behind your obedience, you are about to have increased standards for your economic behaviors. God is trying to get a different level of wealth and resource to you. So he's watching your interactions with your present resources. You are about to be taken somewhere in your life that you've never been taken before. But consider being released set free, emancipated from the opinions of people, even the ones you might really love and or think you need in the name of obeying him. That's the question that has always changed my life. And he asked me last week. <laughs> Woo! So this is the aftermath. So this is why you see the guy who really honestly don't care about people's opinions. And, you know, I've had websites written against me and I had people who could barely write complete sentences call me a false prophet. And who, by the way, had on a nightgown and rollers in their hair while writing it. Uh, I look at stuff like that and I'm like, at least I'm with good people. I mean, they call Jesus a false prophet, you know, whatever. I don't care. But I really, this is why you see what appears to be a very brutal, abrasive jerk. It is thick skin. It is a military upbringing. But it's more than that. The love of God constrains me. 
and make sure that at all costs, irrespective of whatever accusation, whatever statement, I love him enough to endure it all. So that's really why it doesn't matter to me. Certainly, I can be mean. I can be abrasive. I can be brute. I really don't care. But underneath that I don't careness is a deep, focused, impenetrable love for Jesus that allows me to like being hated for him because of him. Makes me feel good. So tonight, I'm praying for you all 34,000 of you that follow me on Periscope, I'm praying for you that whatever this next season in your life holds, whatever choices, whatever options, whatever opportunities, whatever audiences, whatever promotions, whatever covenants, whatever agreements, whatever partnerships, whatever contracts, whatever contacts, Whatever is headed to you, that you don't miss it, trying to make people understand it. That you don't lose it, trying to lay hold of people's agreement with it. There will come a day where you may be asked to lay something down or pick something up in the name of the Lord. And the deciding factor behind your energy to do it is going to be how deeply you love him. Woo! Glory. And if you love him, you won't really feel all that you could feel. The love of God or loving him in worship is almost like an immunity to what people have the power to do and or say to you. So when people are still controlled by and ruled by and reigned by the opinions of men, it's not until you become like David that you can say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? <laughs> the Lord is the strength of my life. Who shall I be afraid of? You see, when you love him, you have an immunity. And that immunity is, there is not anything a man can do to you. Fear them not, Jesus said, who have the, the power to hurt the body but rather only fear the one that can punish the soul by putting it in hell. So in the name of Jesus, be delivered from the pressures of people. Be completely cut by the cords of the conversations of those who can't seem to understand why God has called you the way he has, why he's using you the way he is, or why he has made a decision to do what he's going to do. Come out of the mind control, the emotional instability, even the comparison that you place on yourself about where people are in their journeys and where you are in yours and how easy people's lives are and how deeply tested you feel all the time. Be delivered tonight in the name of Jesus and the peace of God that passes all understanding Guard your heart and mind. Be set free tonight. Rest well, guys. I hope this blessed you. Uh, it wasn't a parable, bruh. I just gave you my life and some behind-the-scenes stuff. And I hope it meant something to you. I know y'all probably need to go worship now, don't you? Go ahead, lift your hands. <laughs> and worship it right where you are. Go ahead, get you some quiet time on. But I told the Lord, yeah. If loving you means hating or being hated by them. Fine. I'll do it. I love you. All right, Scope. So, yeah, um, join us Sunday for our new uh, series, ABBA. Uh, and if you believe it or not, people are still sewing into my building project. So come, 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 come. I mean, we, we're ready to close any day now. Uh, but people are still sowing and giving. Don't miss an opportunity to give. You can give on allnationswa.com or you can give via text to give by texting All Nations WA uh, to 77977 and you can give that way. Uh, so we're moving forward. So I love you guys so much. Consider my nighttime devotional. Anybody called by God to do anything memorable, anything 
worth its weight in salt or anything that is going to affect anybody when you're gone. You're going to have to answer that very same question. Are you willing to be hated for me? You love me enough to be hated for me. All right. Love you guys. Get some rest. If you in Indy, it's 77977 if you want to give via text to give to our church and our building project. If you're at Indy, I'll see you tomorrow. And uh, peace. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.